Hello, welcome back to lecture number four on the topic of thermal processes in the lithosphere. In this lecture, we're going to look at some examples of heat advection. And so we have two examples we'll look at in this lecture. Uh, first is a little bit more detailed look at erosion and sedimentation, and then we'll consider the case of groundwater circulation and its influence on the thermal field in the crust. So there are basically two geodynamic situations in which advection is important, and that is when we have cases of advection by movement of solid rock, which could be erosion at the surface, which is acting to allow deeper rocks to move up toward the surface, or faulting, um, where its movement is perhaps a bit more clear, as well as advection by fluid circulation, such as groundwater circulation in mountainous regions where the flow velocities can be relatively high. As we've seen in the previous video lecture, there are different effects for erosion and sedimentation, and so I won't belabor the point here, other than to say that erosion tends to increase temperatures in the crust, and sedimentation tends to decrease temperatures in the crust. So if we take our solution that we had from the previous video lecture for the one-dimensional heat advection and diffusion equation, we can make plots of things like this, where we have a black line indicating a case where there is no advection and there's no heat production in this equation, so temperature simply goes from zero to, in this case, 1300 degrees C at a depth of 100 kilometers, and it's a straight line. If we consider positive values for the advection velocity, we can see that the temperatures are slightly warmer at an advection velocity of 0 0.1 uh, millimeters per year, significantly warmer when you go to one millimeter a year, or if when you go to five millimeters a year, you can see temperatures increase again quite significantly, such that even in the uppermost part of the crust, the upper 10 kilometers of the crust, you can hit temperatures of 1,000 degrees or so with this particular solution that we're using and the boundary conditions that we're using here. So this is an example on the top in red of cases of uh, the influence of erosion. If you look in the bottom, you'll see essentially what looks like a mirror image, and that is the effect of sedimentation, where obviously larger sedimentation velocities can push very cold temperatures to extreme depths. In this case, with five millimeter a year uh, accumulation of sediment, we would predict temperatures of almost zero at 60 kilometers depth. Now, of course, in this example, this is just meant to illustrate how the equations operate um, and perhaps not necessarily the best choice of boundary conditions for the problem that's being solved, because here we're assuming that sediment is being accumulated across the entire thickness of the lithosphere, uh, which is obviously not the case typically. Here's another example of um, the evolution of the temperatures in the crust um, in response to erosion. And in this case, this is a figure out of a paper um, from 1997 by Mankelow and Grossman. And in this figure, what we're looking at are cases of erosion that are time dependent. So this solid line here is perhaps uh, what could be considered our initial geotherm. You can see here the surface temperature is zero degrees at uh, depth zero, and at 100 kilometers depth, we have a temperature of 1300 degrees. You can also see that the geotherm here is curved slightly, and that's a result of heat producing elements uh, within the crust. Now, the point of what we're looking at here is that as erosion takes place, when we go from this initial state where there's no advection to having advection, in this case, with a velocity of one millimeter per year, we can see that temperatures increase across the whole thickness of the lithosphere that we're considering. And that in the first 10 million years, the increase in temperature is much more significant than the 30 million years following that, where you have a much smaller change in temperature over that 30 million year period. The solid line that's shown out here on the far right side of all of the lines would be the steady state solution. And so that's the eventual um, temperature solution that would be calculated for the effects of um, 
of advection with an infinite time. Uh, so we still have some significant increase in temperature that will happen uh, even beyond 40 million years, uh, as shown here in this case. Now, to give you an idea of a case where advection of rock is important and, uh, and something um, that might be perhaps of interest in terms of how these types of thermal models are used, uh, we can consider thermal chronometer data, and we could probably give a whole course on thermal chronometers if we wanted to look at the details, but we'll keep it simple here and just um, define a thermal chronometer as a mineral system that records time since rock or mineral was at a specific temperature. So for example, uh, there's a technique that you can do where you analyze the um, abundance of argon-40 to argon-39 in, uh, in micas, and that would give you something um, of a time required for the accumulation of this radiogenic daughter product in the mica crystal that corresponds to the time since it was at about 350 degrees temperature within the crust. So, um, you know, this is, thermal chronology is something that's widely used in studying uh, long-term erosion and sedimentation rates in, uh, in mountainous settings typically. And, um, you know, one of the main concerns or one of the main areas of focus in thermal chronology is trying to define rates of rock erosion or rock exhumation over the times um, that are recorded in these different mineral systems. And so in order to calculate something like a rock exhumation rate, of course, you have to say how deep was the rock when it passed through a temperature of 350 degrees for example. So how deep was this temperature in the lithosphere? And that's where the thermal modeling part can come in, um, can come in handy. So if we have some kind of simple model where we can calculate the different um, depths to these temperatures, perhaps as a function of the um, advection velocity or exhumation rate, we can basically do something like what's shown over here on the right. This is a figure we've already seen for different um, advection velocities showing you the um, geotherms from 0 to 100 kilometers depth with a maximum temperature of 1,000 degrees uh, at the base of this particular model. And if we were to put in our predictions for argon-argon ages, these would basically be the depth or um, time since the rocks were at a temperature of 350 degrees C. We could see for an advection velocity of 0.1 millimeters a year, it would take 320 million years to go from that um, depth up to the surface. It takes 13 million years uh, to go from 350 degrees C to the surface with an advection velocity of one millimeter a year, and for 10 millimeters a year, it takes only um, about 150,000 years to reach the surface. So this combination of dating the mineral systems using thermal chronology and then using a numerical model or a simple thermal model to calculate exhumation rates is something that's commonly done and uh, it's um, a useful practice in studying long-term rates of tectonic and erosional activity in mountainous regions. All right, so the other example we'll consider here for advection is advection by fluid circulation, and in this case we'll consider groundwater flow um, and its importance in advecting heat. Now, essentially what we have um, is something of a complicated problem when we look at groundwater flow because it's possible that you have a tectonic component of rock being moved by a fault that's advecting heat and then you have groundwater flow that might be occurring simultaneously and the velocities may be entirely different from one another um, you know might have tectonic uplift and groundwater flowing downward but we can consider the effect of both of these things using a simple um, equation that combines the effects of fluid and rock Advection. So here we have our dt dt, our change in temperature with time, as being equal to phi times vf times rho f times cf divided by rho c times dt dy. So what are all these letters? Well, phi in this case is rock porosity, vf is the fluid flux or the fluid velocity, 
rho f is the fluid density, and cf is the fluid heat capacity. So you have in here this term that's basically the ratio of the fluid's material properties to the material properties of the rock. The product then in this equation of phi times vf is going to be the fluid volume that's transported through the rock um, per unit time and area. So this allows us then to combine the effect of um, heat transfer in uh, rock and fluid at the same time. Now, again, we won't go through a solution of this equation because it gets a bit complicated, but here's just a simple example from a paper back in the late 80s. What you can see here is basically a slice through one half of a cartoon mountain range where we have two kilometers elevation here and it goes down to about a kilometer, or sorry, about uh, zero at the uh, middle of a valley. So this would be a symmetric case where this is a sort of interfluve or uh, ridge, and then you'd have a valley down here. And our, in orange are the predicted fluid flow vectors. And so this would just show you that if water was to infiltrate at the surface here, it's going to percolate and go down to some depth in the earth and begin to warm up and eventually flow laterally out in to be discharged in the valley. And in blue is the 35 degrees C isotherm. Red is the 65 degrees C isotherm. And here we have a scenario where there's relatively slow flow or the rock has a low thermal, or sorry, hydraulic conductivity. And here we have a relatively high hydraulic conductivity and much more rapid groundwater flow. And you can see quite clearly the effect of this groundwater circulation um, to push the 35 degree and 65 degree C isotherms to much more significant depths when the fluid flow is rapid enough. All right, so that's it for our examples of advective heat transfer processes. And now it's time for you to take your quiz and then come on back for the next video lecture.